I said, what we should do is build a great firewall of Europe and kick out all the American platforms. Uh, we started the California ideology by praising the internet because we love the technology. And so I think this technology is, is incredible. So we were setting up this MA uh, in hypermedia studies. Um, and we had to, we wanted, we sort of wrote it as a manifesto for attracting students. Because obviously, you know, Europe was way behind America in, in 1995. And so that was one of the reasons. And, so, and we also, it's because we were reading Wired magazine. Um, because that was sort of like, you know, that bizarrely is a dead trees publication. Uh, you know, it's where you discover what the latest things were. I mean, the adverts were almost as interesting as the articles in a lot of it. And uh, it was that strange mix of the sort of hippie graphics and uh, libertarianism in both senses, the word, both the right and the left senses of the word, uh, and this sort of gung-ho capitalism. And, I, and, and so we, what we discovered, there were people in Europe, um, I'd say, like, say in England, for instance, who wouldn't be in favour of privatising the health service. But as soon as it came to the internet, they started spouting all this neoliberal bullshit because they were learning it from Wired. And the Wired said the future is neoliberal. That's what the other thing we want to talk about, that sort of bizarre way that they use technology, media technological determinism, McLuhanism, uh, for arguing for a particular set of you know political economy essentially uh, free markets deregulation all the rest of it it's that you know the promise that digital technologies will free us yeah and we're still being given that every few years we're given that promise aren't we every time there's a sort of another iteration and i thought that's exactly what it is you know the particular californian ideology could have only really appeared from california and not anywhere else now, if it happened on the East Coast, it would have be been much more bureaucratic, corporate. Though, though, I, though Peter Lundenfeld said, um, he, sa he said, oh, no, it's, a, it's the Northern Californian ideology. It would have never appeared in L.A. either, <laughs> or Bay Area or Silicon Valley. Uh, but I said, I'm a European, you know, for, you know, it's America and then a bit on, you know. <laughs> At the time, the thing that really freaked out Wired magazine wasn't so much that critique, but because we made fun of Jeffersonian democracy. Andy Cameron, my co-author, had just read Gore Vidal's Burr. And I mean, I, you know, I was in, I've been to the States quite a lot. And it was that that thing about, you know, the way that way that if you say Jeffersonian democracy and think that Thomas Jefferson owned human beings as his private property, it has a rather good resonance for the problems of America. Of course, now, you know, it's got, in a way they've gone to the other extreme and they deny there was a revolution in 1776 uh, with some of the sort of more woke critiques of Jefferson. Um, so we were quite interested in the way that he was both. You know, it's interesting that, you know, he calls it Jefferson democracy because on one hand, you know, he's he, you know, the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence, Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness. Oh, and then when he said, but it's also, you know, he says all men are created equal except those who I own. I think the interesting thing about California ideology, it was probably the last time America was the future. Basically, the empire is in long term decline. And, you know, then you see, you have to understand 1995 was just after the end of the Cold War. And it was the, you know, what's the end of history and the unipolar moment and, you know, full spectrum dominance and all the rest of it. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, I think on rest, you could see that the empire was already actually in decline then, but people didn't notice because its rival had completely collapsed. China is already actually in, in, in what's called purchasing power parity, GMP. It's already 20% bigger than America. And by the end of the decade, it will be bigger than the United States of America, the EU and Japan put together. You know, in the same way, the Californian ideology is this weird ma mashup between sort of hippie anarchism and neoliberal entrepreneurship. They've obviously got having some very strange mashup between sort of Maoist Confucian values and their, their sort of dynamic economy. I mean, it's obviously interesting because it's the first, you know, I mean, you know, the West has been dominant for 500 years and suddenly the East is going to be dominant. That's the thing. And, and they have a very different take on what they see as the acceptable future. Well, I said this Chinese comrade, right, he said a really interesting thing. He said, well, you have to understand that most of the people in China are, are only like a generation away from subsistence farming. 
you see that's what people in the west don't realize you know they were really really poor <laughs> i mean because obviously there'd been a century of humiliation that they went through and so people were really really desperately poor so accept a level of social discipline that we're not willing to accept because it's delivered the results i think it's more than that it's the fact that they're willing to embrace these technologies at a much faster rate than we are you know they talk about shenzhen time you know so and then what's more they're universalizing them. it's interesting it's like uh, there's this wonderful statistic that that um, tibet has better 5g coverage than new york so Tibet is basically the back end of beyond. I mean, okay, they're developing it like Xinjiang at the moment. These sort of, but essentially they're not. It's not on the east coast, you know, where modernity is. So the belief was that the technology inside the technology was this neoliberal paradigm. So, you know, in a sense, it's this sort of weird adaption of Marshall McLuhan. You know, so McLuhan says we have oral culture and then print culture and then audiovisual culture. And, it, you know, the audiovisual culture, even he was, because he was told by the American Cybernetics Society in 1964, the internet is coming. So he said, oh, there's going to be this global tribal drum, you know, the global village, you know. So we'll have, you know, it'll be the whole world, but it'll be the intimacy of the village. And, and then they've twisted that after... You know, you know, by the by the eighties to say, well, actually, what that means is free market capitalism. The, the the problem is, is if they don't, you know, at the moment the Americans still control certain key technologies over things like basically about chip making. The Americans have intellectual property over it, which means that they so they can they can actually stop the Chinese overtaking them in chip production but sooner or later because they're just going to throw enough people and money at it the chinese will produce faster and che cheaper chips than anyone it's not as if britain you know if you look take the british you know the british ruled the world from 1815 to you know the first world war and the americans have basically ruled the world since 1945 so they're not going to you know so, so the, the empire will take some time to disintegrate. But as I said, I, if you look at, you know, the, the size of the market, the key technologies, you know, things like, I mean, all the obvious things like high speed rail or 5G, and they're already falling behind. And it's a cumulative process, isn't it? But going back to California, at an ideological level, it's really difficult for if you bought into the Californian ideology to accept that the Communist Party of China has somehow surpassed you, because the story was that communism, in inverted commas, <laughs> really existing social was a failure. It's all, you know, poverty and people in queues and, you know, the, the, the secret police coming around and raiding you in the morning. And then suddenly it's not. It's actually where all the advanced technology comes from. The problem we have is that we're completely dominated by the Americans. And I said, what we should do is build a great firewall of Europe and kick out all the American platforms. The best thing the Chinese ever did was build the great firewall. They were, I mean, I, for years, I used to teach it as this you know, example of the panopticon and controlling and censorship. But it turns out as an economic uh, tool, it was act of pure genius because now they've got all their own companies. So once they've got your own companies or based on your own market, then you have got the critical mass to be able to overtake the Americans. And, you know, they've got a cash, you know, they're now innovating more than the Americans are. And now it's going to be a bit of a shock when most of the world's population live in the East. They live in East and South Asia. That's where most of the world's population live. And sooner or later, they're going to be as rich as we are. And therefore they will, because they're the biggest population, they will... The, the world will start to gravitate around them. And in fact, if you think like 500 years ago, that's where the richest countries were, were India and China. And we were just like some barbarians out in the West, weren't we? But then we technologically took off by working out how to sail around the world and discovering the empty continent of, the United, of Americas. <laughs> yeah, they think we're a great power still. But that's because when they were, you know, I mean, I'm quite an old person, I guess, but even the older people is that Britain still did have an empire up to the 1960s. I mean, when we come back to the Californian ideology, this is, you know, partly what America's running on this power that, it, you know, Britain 
accumulated this enormous power by the late 19th century and it's taken over 100 years where it can run on the the momentum of that and america's in the same position that was why i tried to do in imaginary shoots is to show the imperial side of it i mean there is a it's an imperial ideology but you don't it's not now the interesting thing is it's very appealing at one level isn't it because they say you know if you've got a great idea and you're hard working and you're a bit lucky you can strike it rich and you could be hip and rich, basically. And you can do it when you're young as well. You're not, it's not like you have to wait till you're old and doddery. You can, you can make lots of money when you're in your 20s or 30s, which is when you can have fun with it. But it's also that mo the unipolar moment when America was the, was the future. And it, that's the point. It, it is, you know, if you own the, you know, if you if you own time, you can control space basically. Because lots of people will say, okay, America's doing this wrong or that wrong, or it's you know, blah blah. But it's the future that America today is the beta version of the rest of the world tomorrow, and that's a very powerful position to be in. I mean, you know, that was the appeal. You know, you can think about, you know, to use the example of its Cold War. There was a long period of time where people would say, well, the Soviet Union has all these problems but it's the beta version of the next stage of human civilization. And that was very, very attractive. People were absolutely blind to really obvious downsides of the Soviet Union because it was the future. You know, there is this vision which the Russians had in the late 1950s, early 1960s, where you could basically replace the state and the market with the mainframe. You could have real-time planning. You know, this is what this guy Kantorovich won a Nobel Prize for it. In economics, the the fake the fake Nobel Prize in economics, and you can see that they you can see that they're part of the Chinese state think that they're going to do this. You know, they're already you know they you know they've already got know what everybody's doing in the city and they all know what people are buying and they're all connected with these supply chains. Um, and you could get rid of the market. You could just use it all by planning. And so they got this vision where you could say, oh, right, well, OK, we're now in hyper capitalism. But don't worry, folks, in 30 years time, we will be in whatever, you know. But that's a sort of level of regulation, which I think Westerners, for very obvious reasons, given their experience of the 20th century, find a bit worrying. You know, the West goes on about tracking and tra I mean, they're very good at tracking and tracing political distance. They don't like, but they're useless at using it for health purposes. That, that's one of the ways that they, they've beaten the pandemic so far. There's this guy called, uh, what's he called? Daniel Dumbrell, that's right, who lives in Shenzhen. Okay, it's, Shen, it's Shenzhen, so it's, but I assume it's, it seems to be in the rest of the country as well, where he was showing his smartphone, now this was like 2020, and it showed on the smartphone where people were under lockdown. So they were tracking individuals and they then they've said, I think the BM, the British Medical Journal, had a thing about how, how somebody, they found someone's infected and then they go and find all, everywhere they've been, everyone they've been in contact, and they tr use, they test them and work out it's the same variant of the virus. And they, they create little tracking, you know, track, literally track how the virus has spread and cut it off. So that's a granular level of detail. Whereas in the West, we've just let, you know, it's just herd immunity plus vaccines. Well, we don't have any privacy anyway. That's the whole, that's the whole crap. I mean, you know, when they, that, that's all disappeared decades ago. So we don't have any privacy. Amazon, Google, they're all correcting your information all the time. There's all these like paranoics who are saying, oh, the vaccine has 5G tracking devices. I said, hey, you've got a bloody mobile phone. What are you talking about? You've already got a tracking device. You're carrying it around in your pocket all the time. As I said, it's interesting because if you look at, say, the, the Barcelona, the open data, that's that's a much more interesting because they say, well, they, we're collecting this information and we should make it obvious that we're collecting this information and give people democratic control over it. That's why we wrote the democratic, you know, the digital democracy manifesto. We need to control this data. That's the problem. I mean, you know, you know, do you want to give all your information to Google, Amazon, the NSA? CIA, or do you want to give it to the CPC and its corporations? That, that's what we'd be given the choice, which doesn't seem to me like a choice. You know, some people think the Chinese model is better because it's more socially oriented. It's got some long, at least it has some long term goals. Doesn't just think of the next quarter's profit figures. You know, if we've got the, the Californian ideology model is actually leading to this sort of corporate dominance, yeah without any social control, but other than how much they can, you know, how, how much profit they can distribute on Wall Street. 
And then the other model is the, the CPC ruling it, essentially. And there are people who argue for both of these models yeah, as the future. You know, they're both building the future in different ways. But, you know, so if we, if as Europeans, we have to think of something better, it strikes me. So that one of the arguments, and that's what, you know, I said, uh, the people in Barcelona have done, I think, have been, done some really interesting stuff on it, is how, how, do you, how do you try and move the power back to the citizenry? So, you know, the question is, that, so there's all these positive things about it, but the trouble is that it also can empower these very authoritarian institutions. And relying on the free market, which is basically what the current Paulian ideology is, not a, it's not a solution because the California, you know, if you play a game of Monopoly, it ends up with one person owning all the properties and all the money. It, it was invented by Elizabeth Maggie to warn people Monopoly. It's a game that was invented to warn people about capitalism, <laughs> not a celebration of it. Uh,